as I can. Some are starting to come through. Thank you. Uh, I'll just start with a, a couple. Um, Marion, when I was reading your book, I was very conscious that, that forgiveness there is very much a direction rather than a destination, mm. that it's a process. And you, you took steps forward and then you felt you were going back. And I just wondered whether when you're thinking through that, uh, uh, that direction of forgiveness, whether you think you forgive what happened to you or forgive what happened to Lucy? I feel um, that Lucy and I are deeply connected. Hmm. So it's not I would never forgive the actions of the West, but what I've learnt is, you know, and what happened to Lucy has made me have to look at myself and have to hold that tension really between the atrocity and the peace that passeth understanding. So it's, it's, um, made me have to face my own need for forgiveness. Mm. Um, so I haven't, but it's also made me have to face, especially through my work in prison, the extreme, cruel, violent actions of others. Um, so it's quite a complex, mm. I just find it hard to answer that question in a simple way. And maybe the question's a wrong one. I mean, maybe, <laughs> you know, sometimes yes. questions frame it in such a way mm. that, that you can't give a... I don't see it as a separate thing anymore. No, 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 thank you. Well, that, that's mm. and, and Lucy, as I was listening to you, I was thinking of um, uh, an essay by Rowan Williams, who was reflecting on all the events of the 20th century and how he, he actually says in it, that we must be aware of the dangers of forgiving too easily. And I wondered, because I heard that being touched on in what you said, what do you think he means by that? For the dangers of forgiving too easily. I think I mean, it, I, I started really by saying that I think the church has got a lot to answer for in how we think about forgiveness. And I suppose what I, how I would interpret not forgiving too easily is, is that first part of the quotation I ended with, keep your mind in hell mm. and despair not. So that, you know, and, and in the Christian tradition that's expressed by the story of Holy Week, where Jesus harrows hell. Mm. He, he w it's, it's not a kind of, you know, the crucifixion comes before the resurrection. So to go, to go too quickly to what you imagine is what you should be feeling, which is, I guess, a, a forgiving of, of a person who's wronged you or a, re or a resolution. To go too quickly to that uh, resolution means that you're avoiding hell. You're not keeping your mind in hell. And to face that honestly is, I, I guess, uh, I mean, all, it's almost impossible. It's, it's, it's just before being completely impossible, but it, it's necessary in order truly to be free freedom, it, it's a kind of, as Julian Rose was saying, a false delusion of innocence. It's a false freedom mm -hmm. if that hasn't been faced. Mm. Could I, yeah. Thank you. Could I add yes, something? Please. Yes, please. I feel that this whole business of premature, premature forgiveness is something that I've really looked at quite a bit. And um, 
And after I'd made that vow to forgive the West and experience the murderous rage, I then felt this feeling of contempt, which came when I remembered my mother standing by Lucy's grave and all of us gathered there. And I just realized that I was nowhere near even in that moment, wanting to go in that direction because I realised that we all had to find a way of grieving and expressing the, the depth of this loss and, in a way, finding compassion for ourselves, kindness for ourselves, before we could ever think of doing it for anyone else, let alone the Wes. Mm, thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions which are coming in. Let's begin them. Um, should forgiveness require repentance? A couple of questions have come in asking that. Lucy. Mm. I think that there's, I mean, we're talking about forgiveness being a, a journey of, of freedom or a journey to freedom. And there are some kinds, I guess there's different kinds of forgiveness. There must be a kind of forgiveness which is a release for the person who is forgiving, um, but has not depended on the repentance of the person who is being forgiven. And that's often the case when to release yourself from an action that someone has done to you who then dies, to be able to address that mm. forgiveness I believe is possible. Mm -hmm. So the, sh the short answer is, I don't think that, I think that forgiveness uh, defies a neat definition and that it's, it, fi it lives in the lived experience of each person in this, in this room. So any easy definitions of forgiveness are, not, are just not going to work. Mm. So the answer would be yes. When you go to a service, it suggests mm. that God won't forgive you unless you say, I'm sorry. Mm. And yet in the human world, mm. we're saying it might not be quite like that. Mm. I think, it, I mean, the, the language I would much rather use is uh, take, take all the shoulds and oughts away and that, that it's, it's an irresistible invitation. It's an invitation to repent. And, you know, it, it, confession, I'm sure you hear confessions, and confession sometimes is you know it, i mean it, it's described as a joyful sacrament i think people who don't take part in confession think that it's probably really difficult and he i mean it is of course difficult and heavy sometimes but quite often there's laughter in confession because there is there is a joy in the release of actually saying it as it is and facing yourself as you are and of course it some of the annoying things about Jesus' stories around it are that people often don't say sorry, like right. the prodigal son right. that's already in yes. place. And yes. Anything you would like to add on whether people need to repent in if they can be forgiven? Well, <coughs> in my experience, that hasn't been the case. No. <laughs> so I think Desmond Tutu said that... Um, there is a certain amount of self-interest in forgiveness in the sense, and, and I certainly feel that that's sort of what driven, has driven me in a way. It's this desire not to have my own life corrupted by what's happened so that I can live a full life and um, not become stuck in a place of bitterness, hatred or revenge. It's been very much about needing to be alive in a creative, loving way. <laughs> and that isn't dependent upon repentance. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to add uh, two questions here so that we, we get as through as many as we can. Um, is forgiveness always personal? Is forgiveness ever collective? And maybe connected to this, should the people of Zimbabwe forgive Mugabe? Has come in there, <laughs> which is a <laughs> little bit collective. Uh, 
And does forgiveness mean you don't have bad feelings about the person? Can we look to Lucy for the collective? Mm. I, I can't speak for the people of Zimbabwe, um, <laughs> but I, I think that there is some, I want to, s there's a personal experience here which, which changed my mind about this issue, collective apology. There were two things that happened. It was the, I, I watched on television uh, where, when David Cameron stood in the Commons and after the bloody Sunday inquiry had reported and it had taken such a long time to report and he apologized on behalf of the government for that event and the way it was something about the way that he did it the timeliness of it it was very soon after the report reported and I thought okay I I can hear that as a as a as a, as a prime minister uh, apologizing for an event that had happened when he hadn't been responsible for it. And th the other personal experience actually was in this cathedral on the 20th anniversary of the ordination of women's service. And I was sat over there somewhere. And for those of us who were in the first generations of mm. ordained women, I won't go into it, but it, it, you know, it wasn't easy. And I had no, I had no expectation that any note of apology would be at all in the service. It was very joyful. Everyone was very happy that there had been 20 years of ordained women. But the Archbishop of Canterbury, at the beginning of his sermon, uh, said sorry. I, I was, I was completely overwhelmed by that apology from an authority figure, I suppose, for something that he thought had been done that was wrong to the women who were gathered in the cathedral. So from my personal experience, I didn't know that I needed it, <laughs> but it, when it happened, I was, I was released from something 20 years later. Mm. It, was, it, was, it was actually miraculous. Mm. Thank you. Can we just yeah. look at the, um, sorry. I was just thinking about this um, collective. Yes aspect <coughs> and it made me think of the uh, obviously the truth and reconciliation commission in south africa mm. but i had three months living on vancouver island doing some research into um, indigenous approaches to the healing of trauma and when i was there um, it was towards the end of a truth and reconciliation process for the first nations people in relation to the residential schools and um, most of my experience of being there was listening and to stories of terrible suffering that has been caused by the forced enforced residential school system and the attempt and when I got back the then Prime Minister Stephen Harper said um, apologized for the attempted cultural genocide of those people and I I know that the, the sort of politics that have followed since and the actual very very slow way that how could this reconciliation happen after so much generational abuse etc but um, it just uh, made I just there was something about even being able to use that phrase that I found quite impressive and I thought you know at least they're naming it mm. so something can happen from that moment mm. and the, the, and so it just seemed and I was thinking how much does that happen here you know it's mm. quite difficult to have a, a national cultural sense of forgiveness when something isn't being even faced or named. And can I just come back to that mm. second question specifically to you? Because I think there may be people in here tonight hearing you thinking, how does it, how is this done? How does this feel when you've forgiven somebody that, that's done the things that they have to you and your family? Are the bad feelings still there, even though forgiveness has been given, or 
Well, I just see, I don't see forgiveness as a noun that you tick off. Yeah. I see it as an ongoing verb in everyday life. And I don't see that I've reached a fixed place. As you noticed in reading the book, it sort of comes and it goes. And, mm. you know, there are times when, you know, I can, you know, I, I in just in family situations, it's, it's, um, something to do with just trying to pay attention to um, feelings that are going on and sometimes choosing not to express them or... Yes, yes, thank you. Um, two questions here, and I think this is an important topic to bring into the conversation, about people who don't believe in forgiveness, that actually it might be a morally wrong thing to do, um, that you'll somehow... Uh, skating over people's accountability and there's a question here how can you get someone who is terribly unforgiving and happy about that <laughs> to start to be more forgiving um, let's start there um, Lucy I don't think you can <laughs> And I think, I think one of the things that I'm learning listening to Marion is how, I'm, I'm using the word probably slightly wrongly, but how umbilically linked m me understanding or recognizing or knowing my need of forgiveness is to the raising of the possibility that I might be able to forgive. So the journey inwards is the journey, that's the kind of adventurous, brave journey. So I think you, you can't then say to somebody, well, you can try, you should forgive, or I, I'd like to tell you how you can forgive. But that's, to me, start, it's starting in the wrong place. Mm. So the only way that I can make you do anything is by, by living it and inviting you into something that I know about. Otherwise, there's no integrity in that. That's why I think pre it's hard for priests, you know, to, to we're, we're, we're all a bunch of finger waggers, aren't we? And we're telling people what to do and Speak how to for live. Speak <laughs> <laughs> yes, And, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, yeah. It, it's very, that dynamic is so unhelpful. It, yes. It, and it's not just it's not just unhelpful. It actually prevents the action of forgiveness, or prevents the journey of forgiveness, because then it's mis misdiagnosed, if you like, and misdirected. And it's all about you should forgive. So I think you can't start there. You have to start in here. Hmm. Anything to add, or shall I move? Um, on? Well, I'm just thinking about the process of restorative justice, uh -huh. which is rooted in. Um, came from the sort of Canada's um, process of, s of sitting in a circle, bringing everyone together who've been harmed by the actions of someone. So the members of the community, the so-called perpetrators and family, the so-called victim and family, and just sitting. And um, the word forgiveness isn't in the circle. <laughs> it's very much about each person having a chance to talk about the context of what happened and what was going on in their lives. And gradually, as those feelings are expressed, something can change. But um, one of the things that I stays in my mind of someone that I read recently was that the minute you put the word forgiveness in there, it stops the process. <laughs> that, you know, it's a matter of going with what's actually arising for each person. And it's not within a, you know, it's like my thing about needing to reclaim the words. But I think these words can really cause people to shut down rather than dare to express what they're actually feeling. And, and there again, there aren't sort of right and wrong feelings in the process. It's so you're not repressed or suppressed by an, an ethic that's expecting you to be a certain way. 
Mm. There are two or three questions here in the same area. And I think it's coming from this idea that forgiveness may be something that we discover more than do. <laughs> Nevertheless, as somebody has written here, how do I forgive when I suffer with the consequences of what happened to me every day? Well, I think in my experience, it, I, I think there's something about having a strong intention to want to do that. Um, and once that came, then things came into my life, unexpected things that helped me move in that direction. Mm. So I think just if that person really wants to forgive, uh, you know, whether they're <coughs> ready or not, if they have a sense that that's the best way to go, just to actually really, you know, if they have a faith to pray about it, if they haven't, just to really focus and, you know, maybe write down, you know, this is what I would like to do, this is how I would like to proceed and begin to trust what actually comes up emotionally or, or you know, somebody coming into your life. I mean, that's how it worked for me. I had no idea how it could happen, but, you know, it's led to this moment of being here with all of you. So <laughs> it's quite, to me, it's some very mysterious, but it seems that having an intention to want to do it does somehow open up what I would call grace. Uh, and somebody else in a very similar vein has said, I understand the need for forgiveness intellectually, but I just have practical difficulty and <laughs> resistance. <laughs> Are there any daily steps that will help? How do you do mm, it? Yeah, <laughs> do I? Do I do it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that there is so much in ordinary life that tries to tries to shut, uh, I'm not going to use the right words, tries to shut our hearts, if I can put it like that, because we, we often need protection. You know, sometimes it's, it's the right thing to do to, to shut ourselves because we need protection from the harm uh, either of our past or of, or of the present. But I think in, in the shaping of a, of a forgiving life, maybe, uh, we are living that right now. I, in this moment, we have some, uh, choice is quite a hard word, but we have some choices about the deeds that we do from today or the, the ways mm. that we act from today. We don't have any choices about what happened five minutes ago, but we have them from now. So for me, my, I, I pray because it's part of a, my spiritual practice but almost the only prayer is to you know prize my heart open God please can I help help me keep it open because there's so much that is trying to persuade us to to shut it down and so I so for me that but that that would uh, that would be true for the operation of love of forgiveness uh, and all of those, you know, words that echo around churches like this. But I, I, I also think that forgiveness is not what we think it is. Whenever I, whenever I think I know what forgiveness is, it, it moves. I think it's elusive and mysterious, highly creative, imaginative, and we, we don't really have words to put around it to say what it is. And I also think that quite a lot of the time we can't and when we can we can and until we can we can't and it's being gentle with ourselves about that bit before we can uh, and Oscar Wilde of course once said you know always forgive your enemies nothing annoys them more <laughs> What about those like Martha Nussbaum, the philosopher, who actually says you must get rid of anger and forgiveness because both are actually still in control mode. Mm. They're not about love. 
because to say I forgive you it means that you've got the control button and love is not about that what do you say to people like her I I think it depends on where you start from as to whether you think that's a good idea or not mm. and my sense is that that's not a very good idea for people who are powerless to start with. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, a lot of theology is done from the top down. So it's all about giving up, or giving up agency, giving up autonomy, that love is giving yourself away. Oh, that's that's mm -hmm. all good stuff. But if you've started from the edge and you've started from a place where you didn't have any agency or your agency was removed from you, then your path to salvation is entirely different. It's about, it's about not being immediate. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the easy forgiveness, not going straight for forgiveness, not going straight for humility. It's a redeemed humility. And for, and for women, I think women do understand that uh, in a very particular way. Uh, one, one of the v ways to illustrate that is um, Jesus uh, put a towel around his waist and washed the feet of his disciples. That's the kind of picture of love and servanthood and I think for, for, for women and for many others who find themselves on the, on the edges and on the margins of a, of, of a power dynamic, we have to learn to stand first before we kneel. So our humility is a redeemed humility, it's not humility that's too easy and so I think that the the, par the path of forgiveness and the path of love is rocky. And if you start from the edge, then you know Jesus called the woman from the edge to come and stand in the center before she continued with the rest of her life. So the, the path is different and it, it depends entirely where you start from. So for people without agency, I, do, I don't agree with the philosopher that you've just mm. quoted. Okay. Uh, time is nearly over and there is a question here that's specifically for you if I may ask it if you had met Rose West you would have forgiven her but what else would you ask her or say and why um, if that occasion arose as a possibility I wouldn't know until I got there um, I would just, uh, I would just sit and wait. Have you imagined that meeting? Well, I, I was, I would be, I have thought of it as a possibility, but it, I mean, it took, I remember when I was working in Bristol prison in the early days and I spent some time on, um, a lifer's wing and we were just left um it was an extraordinary afternoon and um and i think i remember asking them do you, you know how do you live with what you've done do you think about it a lot or do you try not to think of it how do you live with it and um they all wanted to talk about it because nobody had really asked them mm. I mean, they have psychologists, but they'd insisted they didn't want psychology in there because they always thought that, you know, things that they said could be taken against them. So it was an amazing opportunity. And, um, and I remember one man saying, yes, we think about it all the time, but we never talk to each other about it. And then one man said, it's taken me 10 years to accept what I did to face and accept it and I'd had this experience just before we found out what happened to Lucy I remember driving to my mother's house and thinking what would it feel like to know what had happened to Lucy what if this really is something about that and completely out of blue into my mind came I would want to meet them but I wouldn't want to meet them for 10 years so I don't know where that time of 10 years comes from, but it's now 
20 odd years since we found out what happened to Lucy and um, and I wrote the le I sent the letter in 2008 so that was 94 84 at 14 years after we found out and I think when I sent it you know there was a sense that if a meeting arose from that I would be ready to do that um, but I also I don't know that there are any, you know, what are the questions? <laughs> mm. I mean, what can, I mean, when we work with people in prison in, with the Forgiveness Project, um, we never ask them what we've, they've done, but they often want to tell us and we listen, but that's not the purpose of why we're there. And your whole point you're making about right now we can make choices, I think that's part of what I like to talk about sometimes, you know, that you can actually make decisions about your life that mean that you can choose to not do things or to look at things, you know, it's not a, so if that comes up, you know, I think that's kind of what I'm trying to express when I talk about my experience, I'm trying to give an example of what I found helpful and mm. that that is sometimes picked up on. Um, but it is the most moving, fulfilling work because it's completely undone a lot of my prejudices and my sense that of, you know, victim, perpetrator. I mean, those roles, those, I mean, a lot of the work's very much about helping them to recognize what has led them to m commit the crime that they did which is usually a ruined childhood. Um, it's very nearly eight o'clock, and I just wondered, I mean, my guess is if, if everybody else is a little bit like me, um, it has been an extraordinary provocative evening where we've been made to think about the depth of words we often use too easily. And I just wondered if you could give us a final thought to take out of those doors as we make our way home and start our lives again tomorrow. <laughs> um, Lucy. I think I would say try not to be afraid because I think that the this this the single most powerful mechanism of us not being able to live with ourselves or face our past or tell the truth to ourselves about ourselves or to God is, is because we're afraid. So to try not to be afraid and to try to increase our trust. Marion. Oh, I was going to say trust. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> say it. <laughs> yes, I, I think that dare to trust, dare, if there's something that you really want to forgive, really focus on the intention of that and dare to start trusting and listening and feeling what arises within you and what comes into your life. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the Lord's Prayer. Of course, Christians ask that we forgive as we are forgiven every day. What I'm always struck about is immediately after that, there's talk about bread for the morrow, as if the two might be connected. <laughs> And that actually, one of the few things we know about forgiveness is that it stops the eternal echo of the bad things that have been done. It, it, it stops what Hannah Arendt called the irreversible flow of history. Um, and maybe in that prayer, placing for talk of forgiveness next to talk of tomorrow and of bread that feeds us uh, is more <laughs> intentional than we might first think. Mm. Um, 
I'm struck also from the conversation here that we've had this evening and from your contributions and your honesties um, that when I was reading a, a little bit around forgiveness, I came across a very simple comment by um, Anita Roddick, founded mm. The Body Shop. And she just said that she had discovered in her own life that forgiveness is as mysterious as love. And if that's the case, I just wonder whether that maybe says something very, very important. And I want to thank you both very much for all that you've brought here this evening, both of you. I know everybody out there is thinking, what I'm thinking in here is that we've been in the presence of two very remarkable people. And uh, from all of us, thank you so much.